I want you to go in your Bibles to Acts chapter 16. Go to Acts chapter 16. Where we are going to be at this morning is we're going to be looking at three different stories of three different people that all have a unique position in their life. And we're, we're going to tackle looking at their life and who they are and, and uh, how God worked in their life. And my, my prayer for you this morning is that you would listen to these stories and then also recognize in your own life that God has been working in your life as well. That I can remember as a kiddo getting invited to First Baptist Church of Snyder, Texas because a group of rowdy kids showed up with a leader inviting me to come to a Wednesday night function. And we went and we bowled and I went home to my mom and said, you're never going to believe this church is awesome now. We go bowling and we eat pizza. That was what I thought church had become. And then the next week we read the Bible and I was like, so boring. So anyways, what God was doing was working in my life from the very early ages of me living here. And I can remember the conversations, and you've heard me use names and drop these things before. I can remember talking to Ian Hobbs on the steps of First Baptist Church, Snyder, Texas, talking to me about salvation when I went to VBS. And, and what's funny is I can remember those details, but if you think about the ripple effect, you think about that somebody was being led by the Lord to invite my mom to send me to VBS. So God was working in my mom's heart to send me. God was working in someone's heart to send me to camp. I, I honestly can't remember a time whenever I was a kid in which we paid for camp because there was someone that chose out of the generosity of their pocketbook to say, we want to make sure that kid goes to camp. Well, God was working in that person, no telling how long ago, that led them to that point to give their life to Jesus. And when you start thinking about the breadth and the span of God's sovereignty over our life, it is unbelievable to realize and recognize that God is even in the tiniest little areas of your being. That we have a God so infinite, the God of the universe that holds everything in the universe together by His hand, that galaxies and stars were there on purpose, Black holes are there doing what they do, and that our solar system is so primed that we have life on this little blue rock, that God in His ability and His perfect character able to keep everything where it's supposed to be. In the macro level of God's work, He also is involved in the micro level. So just as we sang, every aspect of my life God knows about. And not only does God know about it, but God is involved in it, which means that every aspect of your being, God has been working in the minute details, the good, the bad, the ugly. That I can look back on my life, and I'm not going to divulge into all of our story today, but I can look at the aspects of my life where there was pain, there was hurt, there was joy, where there was community, where there was someone inviting us to church, or there was someone coming and paying for me to do whatever, God was at work even up until now. And He will continue to be at work in my life. And that's my heart and my hope for you this morning, that when we look at the text this morning, you're going to see God work in these people's lives and be renewed in your thinking that God is also involved in every aspect of your life. I've said this before, I have an old pastor of mine that used to say this phrase, there's no neutral moments. And so every aspect of your life is a non-neutral moment of which God is working in your life for you to know Him on a deeper level. And you and I will find our greatest needs met when you and I find our greatest satisfaction in Jesus Christ. When we come to know Him, and not only when we come to know Him at salvation, but then He takes us on this transformational work in our life to show us who He is, to deepen our satisfaction in Him, to grow in godliness, to grow in love for Him, and to see Him transform every aspect of my being. And we're going to see that, especially in these three stories. So go with me to Acts chapter 16, and go to verse 13. I'm reading from the New Living. If you have a phone or a tablet, or maybe you just happen to bring that particular version this morning, but I'm reading from the New Living Translation. I want you to go to verse 13 of Acts chapter 16. 
We covered the first half of Acts 16 last week. If you missed last week, we had an amazing Sunday. We had a one church service where we got to really look at the emphasis of where we're going with mission work, that we haven't stopped, and we're going to continue on in our efforts to reach people for Christ from all around the globe. And uh, we, we talked about how God is involving you. He brings Timothy along, and we want to bring you along for the journey as well. And so you, you start thinking about not only was God working in these people's lives, but there's a potential that God used this first particular story to help church, to help begin the church of Philippi. Go to verse 13. On the Sabbath, this is Paul, on the Sabbath we went a little way outside the city to a riverbank where we thought people would be meeting for prayer. And we sat down to speak with some women who had gathered there. One of them was Lydia from Thyatira, a merchant of expensive purple cloth who worshipped God. As she listened to us, the Lord opened her heart, and she accepted what Paul was saying. She and her household were baptized, and she asked us to be her guest. If you agree that I am a true believer in the Lord, she said, come and stay at my home. And she urged us until we agreed. She was persistent. She's like, Thank, you've changed my life. Hey, I, I'm, I'm a true believer. If you'll have me, well, we'd love to have you. And so what we see about Lydia is she was a seller of purple, and she was from a town called Thyatira. Thyatira was a pretty prominent place. A lot of money, a lot of trade going on in there. One of the interesting things about Thyatira is that they had a lot, um, a lot of work in textiles and clothing. And, and so she sold purple. Well, purple was a prominent color. It was, a, it was like what wealthy people wore. So you kind of get the sense that from Lydia, she's a businesswoman. She's kind of first century fashionista, okay? She, she's... So all you women that love clothes are like, yes, I told you, let's go shopping at Target. So anyways, that's, she is, for all accounts, a wealthy businesswoman selling purple. And she is down here where Paul was looking to see if there were any people to gather for prayer. And it says about Lydia that she was a worshiper of God. So we, when we look at the text, we see a couple other places where the Bible really is poignant about describing who a, a worshiper of God is. And oftentimes that means that they were not a Jew, but they were a Gentile that heard or saw how Jews worshiped. And so they said, I want some of that. I believe in Yahweh God. And so they were called a worshiper of God. We see this in Cornelius when you and I go back to Acts chapter 10. Cornelius is a worshiper of God. Now what you and I know, especially in both of those stories, is that even though they've got their eyes and their attention on Yahweh, they've got their eyes and their attention on God, they're still missing the biggest piece of the puzzle, and that is Christ. And we know this because, first and foremost, when Cornelius, we see described about him in Acts chapter 10, the angel of the Lord comes to, or excuse me, the angel speaks to Peter and says, I want you to take a message to Cornelius. And so in that particular case, we see that the angel doesn't say to Peter, hey, Cornelius is doing good. I just need you to just go encourage him. No, it means that their ears and their hearts and their mind are, are primed to receive the gospel message. And even though they're a worshiper of God, they're missing the biggest piece of that, and that's actually to put their faith and their trust in Jesus. This is what I would say about this. we got several little pieces about this story in just a little bit, is that there are some of us in this room that I would call you a worshiper of God, but not a follower of Jesus Christ. And what I mean by that is that for some, you... You love church, man. You, you love the community. You love the music. You love that we've got really good coffee in the back. That's so different than where I came from. It came from a blue tub, and it was nasty. This is good. It's like one of the blessings of coming to the Pacific Northwest. Okay, So you love Bible study, and you love the mission trips we're on, and you love all those aspects. And you would say in your heart, I believe there's a God, but you've never given your life to his son, Jesus Christ, who is God. And so you're a worshiper of God, but you're missing the biggest piece to that. So that's why we see in Cornelius' life, 
Peter goes to speak to Cornelius. In the same sense, Paul comes across Lydia. She's a worshiper of God. Paul could have said, oh, that's great. You're doing well, but he doesn't. He shares the gospel with her. Even someone that has been paying attention and, 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 and kind of seeing things from that angle. But it goes on to say this, that Lydia listened. She listened. There was something that Paul was saying about the scriptures They got her ear, she got a little attention to what he was saying, and she started thinking about and getting the wheels moving about what it was that Paul was saying. And what I want to say about this is just something that I just recognize in my own life, and maybe you recognize it in your life as well. I find that the days ahead of me are harder than they were before in regards to how well I listen. And I'm not just talking about listening to my wife. I'm talking about listening. I I recognize in my own life that I am a very distracted person. Would you agree with me? We we are just a distracted people. We went on vacation a few weeks ago. It was a blessing to go see friends and family in Texas and um, it was really hot there, and we had an outdoor pool where we were at, and it was just a really wonderful property that some of our friends in Midland let us stay at. And we made a conscious effort to put our phones down, shocker, and to just be with our kids. So we read, we talked, we played with kids, we ate Mexican food, it was delicious, and I just listened. And it was this sad moment. It was a wonderful moment, but it was a sad moment for me to realize how distracted I've been in my daily life. That I'm distracted by constantly thinking about my schedule and next thing to do. I'm distracted by all the projects we got going in the house. I'm mostly distracted by that silly idol that sits in my pocket most of the time. I, I've, I've never been so idolatrous in my own life when I realize how much time I spend on my phone. Anyone else? Amen. That I am constantly going to look at something and then I have to go, why? Why did that matter that I saw 12,000 pictures in a 30-minute time span of how to cook brisket or some stupid survey? I I, I I am a distracted person and I'm realizing that the older I'm getting, the more I progress, that one of the biggest tactics of the enemy is to get me distracted. To get me to not listen. To keep me with the loud sounds and the boisterous noises and the people and everything around me just to constantly be this right here. And all of a sudden, I'll realize in my own life, when's the last time that I heard from God? When's the last time I sat down with His Word? And instead of looking for study notes and looking how this Word, I just look and I read and I go, wow, Lord, thank you for speaking to me. And how many times we will say something like this, I just wish God would speak to me. He is speaking to you, but we have muffled his tone by the worldly details and things that cause me the most distraction. There's something about a heart that's prepared to listen. I think about how often I come into this room, and maybe you're as well, that you show up on a Sunday, and man, it's been just chaos getting your kids out the door, or maybe no kids, but you're just, and you get here, and everything's, and you, wherever you're at in your lot, you had an argument in the parking lot, you're getting here, you're, the bucket's passing, you just now got your purse down, and everything, da, 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 and it takes you 30 minutes before you're kind of like, okay, now I'm sitting. It's kind of going on vacation. It takes you six days before you realize you're on vacation. Then you got to get back, and you're like, wow, where did vacation go? It's a little bit kind of how we enter into this room sometimes. There used to be this old school concept of having your hearts prepared to worship. It's an old school concept, but that I literally, before I show up here, my heart's being prepared on Saturday night. And that's not just for the pastors. But more importantly, not only for Sunday morning, but on a daily basis, do I wake up and I'm already looking at my phone, I'm already thinking about what I've got going. Is there an aspect of my life that I'm missing? Because I have failed to listen. That I would, as James chapter 4, verse 7 says, that I would submit my will to the Lord, resist the devil, and he will flee from me. Draw near to the Lord, and he will draw near to you. Am I, and I would ask you the same question as well, are you 
eliminating distraction in your life. Now, you and I have to go to work. We have kids, life, job, all those sort of things. But are you taking the moments like Jesus did to get away when he needed to, to say, I need to go to be with my Father. So let the Word wash over me. There's a lot going on. Am I listening? Now, not only did she listen, but the Word here says that she paid attention. Now, I'm going to tell you, that's, that's not my favorite translation of that. In fact, the New American Standard and the NIV use the word responded. Even the ESV, I think, uses the word pay, uh, paid attention here. It says she accepted. And I, I get those, those are great words. And, but there's a lot of times that I can pay attention to something, but I do nothing with it. Like the other day when the, the bridge got jammed up and there was a seal. Anyone see that? It was awesome. Like, I live on Camano Island. There are seals on the road. That's awesome. I paid attention to it, but I did nothing with it except for slow down in traffic. That's awesome. I paid attention to it, but I did nothing with it. I think we also can accept things and still do nothing with it. I can accept the fact that the sky is blue and grass is green and it doesn't change my daily life. There's something about the word responded, which means not only did I see, hear, and notice, but I make a conscious effort to do something with the information. That I leave here on a Sunday having had the word spoken over me, changing my heart, and therefore I take it into my daily life, the gospel, and it changes how I love my wife. It changes how I go to work. It changes where I work. It changes how I raise my children. It changes what I believe about the Lord. So what happens is a lot of us come to church and we pay attention. We like the song. We love the preaching. and We go home and it hasn't changed anything. You may even accept the Lord into your heart. But has the Lord transformed who you are that you respond to Him? I love how James set up, and this James sets up communion today. There's an aspect that I need to respond by looking at these elements, not as just something I do during worship, and not even just something I just quickly do and we're just moving on, but that I would go, whoa, Christ gave his life for me. And I must respond to him that I place my faith in Him. And then as Christ tells me, those who love Him will obey His commandments. And I, I'm responding by going, the gospel must infiltrate every area of my life. So much so that we see Lydia's life change. She wants to bring Paul and the guys come eat with us. There's a good indicator that she was probably a huge proponent in helping get the church of Philippi off the ground. God was working in her life. She was a businesswoman. Many of you in this room are businesswomen as well. God's working in your life. Some of you are stay-at-home mamas. God is working in your life. Some of you have a lot of money. God is working in your life. Some of you don't know where your next paycheck is going to come from. God is working in your life. And it doesn't matter where you've been, what you've grown up in, or even where you're at today. God is still working in in your life for you to come to know the truth of the gospel, that it would completely set you free and change your life. God was working in Lydia. Now let's talk about another girl. I'm going to, um, I originally told Jared and those guys, verse 18, let's go to verse 16. I'm going to give you a little bit of some setup here. uh, Acts 16, verse 16. One day, as we were going down to the place of prayer, we met a slave girl who had a spirit that enabled her to tell the future. She earned a lot of money for her masters by telling fortunes. She followed Paul and the rest of us shouting, These men are servants of the Most High God, and they have come to tell you how to be saved. Let's just talk about her just for a moment, then we're going to jump to verse 16. She is listed here in Acts chapter 16 as a slave girl. So what did that mean in that particular time, especially as it says the word says that she would tell fortunes. Oftentimes, especially in the Roman world, you would have girls and maybe sometimes guys, but more often than not, it was girls. And what would happen is either a wealthy, prominent family or the government would purchase or kidnap 
young kids at an early age and begin to traumatize children in order for them to later, by their trauma and their abuse and even drugs, to get them to speak utterances and fortunes that would give kings and high authority the, what am I supposed to do in the moment? For example, you'd have a slave girl, a king looks to have a campaign, he's going to take on this nation, and he wants to know from the gods if he's supposed to do it or not. So what they would do is go to the slave girl, induce her with drugs, and hopefully get her in her ecstatic visions, say something, and that king would take that as divine authority from the gods in order to accomplish this campaign. These girls went through it all. Trauma, physical abuse, sexual abuse, Induced with drugs in order to get a word. And so what happens is it's a demon that's inside of her. And oftentimes there are people that have true trauma that when someone does it to them or even self-induced, it kind of becomes a portal, so to speak. And so in some ways they're saying some truth and a lot of times they're not. That's why she's walking around going, they're ones from the Almighty God. So there's some truth to that. But what's going on is this poor girl has been hurt by trauma and abuse. Now watch this. I find this part so interesting. Go to verse 16. This went on day after day until Paul got so exasperated that he turned and said to the demon within her, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And instantly it left her. Your translation may say something like this. She annoyed Paul. I just find that funny. Like Paul's a real guy. There's, there's a girl that's got a lot of needs, a lot of things going on in her life. Paul's annoyed. I, I, I don't know about you, but I have come across people that may seem to be needy, and guess what happens? In my flesh, I get what? Annoyed. Am I the only one in the room? All right, okay, we're all in good company. And what happens is, I'm doing life, I'm doing my thing, someone in my life or my peripheral has a lot of needs, come from a lot of baggage, and all of a sudden they don't know anything else other to do than to be needy. And for me, I go, oh my, gosh. oh my gosh, they are just annoying me. And I can imagine for Paul, he's not Christ. I'm not saying he was wrong, but there's an essence to Paul going, he got annoyed by it. And I think about this slave girl, and honestly, I think about some of you in this room that have a lot of hurts in your past as well. You may not say, I'm a slave girl, but I have trauma that you would not believe in my life. Some of you in this room, you've been hurt by some people. You've experienced trauma from the person that your mom was looking for, a dating relationship, and brought him home. And he hurt you. Some of you were in family environments of which things were done that should never be mentioned here at church. Some of you have been hurt by people. Some of you have been hurt because you brought it on yourself. You got hurt at an early age. Maybe you ran from home. And you said, forget it. I'm going to do me. And you lived for years in alcoholism or drugs or sexual affairs. And you have a pretty beaten past. And so sometimes if you ever get invited to church or you make your way into a place like this, you go, there is no reason I should be in here. That guy on the stage has no clue about who I am. He's telling me about the love of God, but honestly, I feel like God hates me. I feel... Like the slave girl. Maybe that's how you feel this morning. And your experience with most people around you has been that you feel like the person that you come to know or experience, they are annoyed at you and you feel like a very annoying person. And I, I want to just this morning tell you something. Even in amidst broken people like us, the one who is not broken is not annoyed with you. This may not affect most of the crowd, but there are a handful of people in this room that need to hear this message this morning. You have had a very hard past. 
You have had people physically hurt you, sexually hurt you, manipulated you. You have been through it with drugs and alcohol, sexual affairs. You feel like you're a busted, grounded up piece of meat. And I want to tell you this morning that God does not see you that way. That he is not annoyed with you and he desires for you to know what true transformational freedom is like in his son Jesus. So much so that it would completely change your life and this young girl gets her life changed. In fact, what happens is the demon comes out of her. We're only going to presume that she came to know the Lord and the people that owned her get ticked. They're like, great, we bought this girl so she could give us visions. She ain't speaking to them anymore. Guess what? Because she didn't have a demon in her anymore. And this gets Paul and Silas in trouble. And what happens is they get thrown into jail. And this is where I want to pick up in verse 25. So we have the story of God working in Lydia. A businesswoman. Makes a lot of money. God's working in her story. The person that's struggling. Beat up. Hurt. The stuff that you would say, I would never even mention that here at church. God is after you as well. And God is after the third guy. Verse 25, around midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. And the other prisoners were listening. Suddenly there was a massive earthquake and the prisoner was shaken to its foundations. All the doors immediately flew open and the chains of every prisoner fell off. The jailer woke up to see the prison doors wide open. He assumed the prisoners had escaped, so he drew his sword to kill himself. But Paul shouted to him, Stop! Don't kill yourself! We are all here. So I, I love this story as well. There's a guy who's working hard, working in law enforcement. Maybe he's a dude that loves to go hunting, fishing. He's got a four-wheel drive truck, <clears throat> right? Black Chevy, silver. Anyway, so it's... That me, I'm, I'm like, this is the Bible's first redneck. I love it. So anyways, um, I'm doing a lot of assuming the story. Just stay with me. So this guy is just, he's in the law enforcement. Works hard for his family. Comes home. There's nothing wrong with that. You work hard. And provide for your family. What a blessing. And his world is wrecked. When all of a sudden this earthquake opens up doors and prisoners go. Because in those days, guess who's held responsible and accountable for these prisoners? The jailer. Nowadays, the jailer, a jailer would, if something bad happened, a riot, they're not going to hang on, on particular jailers. Here, that guy realizes this went down. I'm losing my life. And so what he does is he goes to grab his sword and he's going, my world just came crashing down. I'm done. There's some of you just like God is working in different stories in this room. There's, every single one of you in this room has a unique story that God is uniquely working in. And for some of you in this room, you have gotten to points in your life when you went, I'm done. This is the thing that ends it all. Maybe you lost your best friend, your spouse. Maybe you got the diagnosis from the doctor that wasn't fitting. Maybe your business went belly up and you don't have money for ramen noodles. And you go, I'm done. I can't provide for my family. I've lost it all. How can I tell my husband? Whatever the thing is, you go, I'm done. And God is involved to say no. Because he looks up and Paul says, stop, don't kill yourself. Verse 29, the jailer called for lights and ran to the dungeon and fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. And then he brought them out and asked, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? So apparently the lights are out. The prisoners are fleeing. The jailer goes, it's on me. I'm done. I'm either killing myself or I'm getting killed by somebody else. And Paul goes, stop. Almost like everything's going to be okay, bro. We're here. He turns the lights on, so to speak, gets the candles that goes over to Paul. And this is the jailer's legitimate question that I think all of us at some point have got to ask. And that is, what must I do to be saved? Because he's saying, I'm about to meet my maker. Either someone's going to help me meet them or I'm going to do it myself. What awaits me after all this? Okay, I got a job. I'm working hard. What happens? Verse 31. 
They replied, Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, along with everyone in your household. And they shared the word of the Lord with him and with all who lived in his household. Even at that hour of the night, the jailer cared for them and washed their wounds. And he and everyone in his household were immediately baptized. He brought them into his house and set a meal before him. And he and his entire household rejoiced because they all believed in God. That does not sound like the story of someone who had insecurity in the afterlife, so to speak. That sounds like an old boy that realized, I'm going to die, and he hears the gospel message, and his life in that moment is resolved to go, if I believe in Christ, my security is secure in him. To which he cares for Paul and Silas, gives them a meal, washes their wounds. For a person that we don't know may have actually gotten killed later, but it was in those moments he goes, I'm in Christ. And for some of you that you are meeting those moments in your life that you would go, I'm done. Can I tell you something? God is not done. God wants to work even in the worst situations of your life to show you his kindness, his grace, his love, that you would even see the worst situations come to fruition and glory because you knew that God oversaw your life and he was involved in the intricate moments. Then each one of these stories, from Lydia to the slave girl to the jailer, that God was intricately involved in every aspect leading up to this moment that they would place their salvation in Christ. And not only that he gives them salvation at that very moment, but that God is working to the very end of their life. That we read in Philippians chapter 1, that the one who started it will finish it. He is the author of our salvation. That you in this room, whether you are successful or not, whether you've been through trauma and abuse, real actual trauma and abuse, or you're just a hardworking guy or gal, there is no, there is nothing in your past that can stop God from working in your life now. That would be my absolute hope for you right now. When you walk out of these doors, you take a look at your life and go, God has been working in it. In the worst and in the best, God loves me and he's working through the pain. He's working through the joy and he's working for my life to glorify him.